Good morning. My name is Barbara Cottrell, and on behalf of the Seniors College of Nova Scotia, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for being here with us this morning. We are joined by Delvina Bernard. Many of you will know Delvina as the lead of the very successful a cappella group for the moment. She is also the proud mother of the award-winning singer and songwriter, Zamani. But today, Delvina is with us to talk not about music, but about her work on the topic of reparations. I won't take the time to list all of the anti-racism work Delvina has done and is doing in our community. I'll limit it to her most current work studying reparations as a PhD candidate at St. Mary's University and as equity and diversity advisor to, Saint to uh, Mount St. Vincent University. We're extremely uh, grateful to Delvina for taking time from her very busy life to explain reparations and tell us what is being currently done in Nova Scotia and around the world to make amends for the harm that has been done to the people of African descent. Thank you so much, Delvina, for being with us today. Well, thank you, Barb. That's wonderful that you've invited me. I'm glad to be here uh, to share this information. And uh, the Seniors College, I want to thank you for the good work that you're doing. And um, this is an excellent forum for, for topics like this. It really is. And um, I'm, I, I, I do hope that um, once I get through this, that we'll have an opportunity to chat and uh, uh, people can ask questions because there's so much coming out about this topic and it's, it's, it's a huge one. So it's, it's difficult for people to know, you know what exactly reparations is. So in my small way from the work that I've been doing, I'm gonna try my best to lend my voice to this conversation uh, so that hopefully by the end of this that you will uh, have some idea uh more so than when we first started so i'm going to just start with our first slide up and uh what i should say is that i'm going to i'm going to sort of ease into the topic using using these slides and walking us uh through these slides um and segue in i guess to some of the more i would say dense uh sort of historical uh political history uh, of reparations. And uh, when we get to that part, uh, I've done my best to sort of like minimize and, and sanitize out all the academic verbiage so that uh, it is clearly accessible to everybody listening. But if it uh, gets a little, you know, dense, if you feel like you're, you're getting information overload, you definitely have my permission to, to get up and walk away, but make sure to still crank your computer up loud so you can still hear me. And that's that. And I can't say anything because I won't be able to see you, right? So I won't even know when you've left. But I'll do my best to try to stay engaging and and I'll and I'll I'll try to prove that I went to school and learned to read dramatically so that at the times when I have to fault over to reading that I, I hope to not sound monotone. I'll try to use my CBC voice is um, I think is a one that keeps us all awake a lot. So anyway, the topic, uh, the way that I'm approaching the topic today, I'm, I'm calling it Pipeline to Prosperity, Reparations and Development, Pipeline to Prosperity. And if we go to the next slide, see the adult educator in me just won't leave. So, <laughs> It's not, so it's not good enough just to have the topic, you know, we, we always want to have some kind of like, you know, desired outcomes or uh, learning objectives. And so that you can sort of feel at the end of the conversation that, you know, folks can say, yeah, okay, we did get to that particular objective and so forth. And we did, we did, we did uh, cover that off and learn these things. So the first thing I'm hoping that we can do by the end of this session is that I want to just try to define reparations, give you a working definition of, of what reparatory justice actually is. Um, I want you uh, hopefully to understand the case for reparations as an economic, social development strategy uh, to overcome the legacy of enslavement, colonization, and cultural genocide. I also hope by the end of this uh, conversation, 
um, that you will know something about what's being percolated around creating a Nova Scotian case for reparations. Because much of what we hear is American, uh, US-based um, uh, writings, um, uh, academics, intellectuals, uh, social justice movement people in the reparations movement who are speaking. And so there are many of us here at home that are also grappling and debating this, this topic. And a lot of times people say, well, okay, I, I, I'm, what, what would that look like? What would reparations actually look like? And um, at least I'm gonna, you know, scratch the surface of that so that, you know, you can go away thinking about it a bit more. And then the question that people ask even more than that is, well, who is responsible? Who's the person? Who's the organization? Who, what, are, what are the entities that are responsible for making reparations? And, that's, that's a, and, and how would that roll out? Now, I don't have all the answers to that, but at least, again, I'm going to um, raise that for further critical debate in the circles that you're in, right? And, just, and then at the end, I'll just say a little something about the fact that it, uh, even though I'm pursuing this in, in a sort of academic frame and doing some theorizing around the, the topic of, of reparations, um, it, it really is also a social movement. So I'll hopefully you'll pick that up through the, through the body of this work. So we're just going to go on to the next slide. So defining reparations. So there are a lot of different ways it can be defined, but I kind of work with the United Nations guidelines in terms of defining reparations and it, because it's so simple. It says making repair for victims of gross violations of international human rights. And that's pretty simple. I think we all can engage with that, that that's essentially what it is. But more than that, what I like about the United Nations definition is that it, it also goes on to talk about what should be included in reparations. And you'll see this coming up on the next slide. So the United Nations recommends that such victims of violation of human rights be entitled to restitution, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and by satisfaction that, that the, 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 the victimized party can feel that there has been you know, a proper resolution. We all know here in Nova Scotia, for instance, that, you know, uh, and we look at the next one, on guarantees of non-repetition, and I'm gonna to come to that example about Nova Scotia, I was getting ahead of myself, guarantees of non-repetition, which means that, you know, we provide the restitution, the rehabilitation to restore people back to the place they were before they were uh, uh, agreed and that they feel satisfied that this has been satisfactorily addressed. But the non-repetition is one that I really like to focus in on sometimes because here in Nova Scotia, I think the example that keeps coming up all the time is in contemporary times to help us understand this is for instance, the police checks. We all know about the a uh, fact of, of, of a lot of people being stopped in their vehicles or just even walking people of African descent. And we know a year, well, more than a year ago, I think it was uh, November of 2019, that the Halifax city officials, including their police chief, made a masterful uh, apology. But then within no time at all, people are still being stopped. I mean, right to the point that this year, uh, a newly elected black woman who is uh, the joint speaker of the house, her and her spouse were stopped while she was driving from somewhere from doing campaigning to be an MLA and uh, guns were drawn. So it's one thing to say that we're going to, you know, rehabilitate, we're going to provide satisfaction, et cetera, to do things, but non-repetition. If we don't build in systems to not repeat the same behaviors, then we're not moving forward. But the one that people talk about the most is always compensation. Because people keep thinking, oh, reparations is about cutting a check to people of African descent. It is about resourcing, absolutely. But it's more than that. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll see that it is, it is more than that. So um, I'm going to just right now, I can leave that slide up, get into a little bit of a sort of background on some of the uh, recent and, and, and sort of less recent uh, reparations history. So I'm just going to say that like, there are many historical and contemporary examples of reparations claims worldwide. Within the 20th century, we know that the Nazi Holocaust of World War II required requiring Germany to pay 
reparations to Jewish victims of genocide. And that remains one of the most prominent and precedent setting cases of reparations being paid. Of near equal significance is the 1919 Treaty of Versailles and the London Schedules of Payments, which demanded Germany pay reparations of 33 million, 33 billion, sorry, US for damages to civilians caused by World War I. In more recent history, there's a increased scholarly interest and social justice interest in issues that have happened of these times too, in terms of Japanese reparations payments for what were called comfort women, women who were captured and used as sexual pleasure items for men of war in Japan. And the Korean government has launched suit against Japan for that. Uh, in fact, the announcement by Japan in 2016 to compensate survivors has played a pivotal role in bringing attention to the emerging global reparations debate. And so, and this wages in a lot of other communities. So what I'm saying here is that reparatory justice as we're talking about it right now, is not something that is just unique to what is happening as far as what the African uh, descended community is, is, de is demanding. And these are things that have been at the table of the United Nations and other kinds of world tribunals of trying to uh, right the wrongs and repair the wrongs when gr there's been a gross violation of human rights. The 2013 announcement by Britain to pay reparations to victims of torture during the Kenyan Mau Mau rebellion also intensified global interest in reparations as well. And actually here in Canada, we don't use the term reparations. But, you know, we have our own reparatory justice case, a uh, milestone case, um, when Canada issued an apology and compensation to Japanese Canadians in uh, 1988 uh, for Ill illegal internment and, again, gross violations of their human rights during World War II. So that's just to sort of provide a bit of context um, and to say that you know, it is not unique to the contemporary debate that we're seeing uh, in terms of the uh, African diaspora. Um, so one of the stories I like to tell when I'm talking about this is, I, I, I just to sort of jazz it up, I call it reverse reparations, is that um, there have been two sort of like cornerstone cases that, you know, really help to build the foundation for a case of reparations today by people of African descent by looking at what has happened in the reverse situation where black bodies were valued and to an amount like a commodity and money's paid for them. But now here we are 400 years later and we're saying that there ought to be monies transferred to compensate for what happened. So um, I think the, the first is within the Caribbean context. I think the gold standard case is the controversial payment of reparations, and that's what they called it, reparations by Haiti to France. So between 1825 and 1944, Haiti was required to pay in what they called an independence debt imposed by France as compensation for slaves lost due to the successful Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804 and the subsequent abolition of slavery in that nation. The Haitian reparations payments lasted 122 years. The amount is estimated to be $21 billion in US currency today, and that this debt and extraction of resources from the Haitian economy was not paid off until 1947. So here we have what I, we always refer to as the reverse reparations and one of the reasons why haiti itself uh under jean bertrand aristide before he was overthrown uh by u.s imperial forces uh he had announced that he is going after france for reparations for extracting those resources so first of all enslavement but then also for them extracting this what they called independence debt because what happened, even though the um, revolution was successful, France was able to take its allies, to gather up its allies, and kept such a threat 
or Haiti, that they would basically invade them, return them to slavery, that they agreed to pay this independent um, independence debt to be able to maintain sovereignty. And so it's no accident to this day why Haiti remains one of the poorest nations in, in the Western Hemisphere, because it started out from such a place of, of disadvantage. Another example uh, that we have is a similar case. So it's not just the French, the British too. The British paid slave owners compensation for the loss of their, in, their, their slave property, their enslaved African property uh, in order to end slavery in 1833. And this was known as the Slave Compensation Act. Uh, in 1833, Britain used, now <laughs> I love putting this figure out because when people ask the question, how are governments or whomever going to compensate uh, for reparations? But in 1833, get, get a listen to this. Britain used 40% of its national budget to pay slaveholders. 40% of its national budget to pay slaveholders uh, in the, so they could basically end enslavement in the British Empire. That amount is, is estimated to be about 17 billion pounds in today's currency. And this debt was not paid off until 2015, which means actually that tax paying black people in the UK were, li were literally paying the debt on monies given to people who enslaved and abused their great, great, great grand, you know, parents of people from their lineage. That I think is the most ironic example. And I think as many historians, and I often like one of the greatest uh, sort of uh, gurus and historians of, of reparatory justice research is uh, from the Caribbean, Dr. Hilary Beckles. And as more of these uh, stories are uncovered, it really helps to build the case for what is being said today in terms of reparatory justice. So. The question kind of keeps coming up as to what is the driver for the proliferation of reparatory debate right now? We know that as they've been happened, this has gone all along and long and long. Uh, we've, most of us have lived through some various movements for uh, social justice, you know, very prominently lived through the civil rights movement, et cetera, uh, of the 60s and 70s. And, you know, there have always been calls for repatriation, calls for repair, and some aspects of compensation, but there's never been such a concerted um, call for reparatory justice as it is right now. So what is the driver? What's causing this to be the way that it is right now? What was the, the lever that you know sparked this huge debate right now? So it's interesting um, that most of the information that we are receiving about, as I said at the outset, from the about reparatory justice seems to be driven by what we see in the U.S. media. Uh, but what really has set off the fires here in this time right now has been led and driven by the Caribbean region. So much so, it's the Caribbean region that has sparked and reignited the debate and the call for reparations by people in the United States and people in the whole, in, on the continent through the African Union, and as well as folks here in the African diaspora, including Canada and Nova Scotia. Um, and so I'm just gonna get into a little bit of the political history uh, with respect to the Caribbean that can help just sort of set up how they have influenced the contemporary debate and what really is at the core of that. So the Caribbean region nations, like so many other colonial nations in the global south, has been the victim of centuries of economic extractivism, which was guaranteed by brute and lethal force and psychological warfare and cultural genocide. <clears throat> Excuse me, what's that? Hmm. So as a consequence, after, after the nations of the Caribbean were pillaged, raped, and cast aside, 
leaving them with no infrastructure after the British no longer needed their resources, these underdeveloped islands have largely depended on foreign aid from their former colonial victimizers. So, but these days, international development organizations are sounding a call for aid effectiveness and greater accountability on the part of aid recipient countries, including those in the Anglophone Caribbean. A number of prominent critics, both on the international stage and in the Caribbean, question the efficacy of these aid transfer payments and challenge whether or not there is a better way and a, an alternative model of economic and human development for the Caribbean. These Caribbean development scholars believe there is a case to be made that the current underdevelopment of Caribbean nations, which is characterized by poverty, illiteracy, class related gaps in educational achievement, a lack of social infrastructure, weakening political autonomy and independence in respect to domestic affairs and dependence upon foreign aid, as we've already said, is a regional deficit inflicted by the legacy of enslavement. We can actually turn up a, a slide there if we can, that captures the next slide, that caps, captures some of this. Um, and we can go to the next one, I think. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Yeah, that's good. So uh, this, is a, this is a deficit inflicted by the legacy of enslavement and colonialism and ongoing economic marginalization by former colonial nations, which is exerted through the political economy of capitalist development. So therefore the Caribbean, and actually this can be said of all black countries and communities that suffered under uh, enslavement, uh, they, re we, they really must be understood not as deficits of some you know, vital developmental factor, but as a feature of the unique history of economic exploitation and cultural genocide. So the underdevelopment of the Caribbean, what I'm saying here essentially, is a result of centuries of enslavement. And this, this dependency on aid has been at the crux of the lack of development of the Caribbean. And these days, as aid organizations are putting more pressure and more strings on how, why and how people should receive aid, and this, this is a never ending cycle. It's like an overblown sharecropping arrangement, essentially. And these Caribbean nations recognize, and here they are in the mouth and in the belly of some of the most affluent places, places in the world, in the Western Hemisphere, in terms of Canada and the United States, they're just a stone throw right in the backyard of where we are. And being the playground for North Americans on vacation, etc. And what we're finding is these nations have basically been pushed up against the wall, pushed up against the wall. And it's because of that being pushed up against the wall that they began to start to think of alternative models of development. Consequently, the heads of the uh, state of 15 English speaking countries, which comprise what is called the Caribbean Community and Common Market, known as CARICOM, they believe there is a case to be answered by former European colonial nations for crimes against humanity committed during the transatlantic slave trade, followed by centuries of genocide, color bar, apartheid, and anti black racism. So in 2013, these CARICOM nations established what is the Caribbean Reparations Commission to prepare a moral, ethical, and legal case for reparations from, Brit from Britain on behalf of the region's African descended and indigenous peoples for the crimes against humanity and genocide during the slave trade. And the fact that they have, were racialized in the racialized system of chattel slavery. The Caribbean Reparations Commission asserts that enslavement has weakened the ability of Caribbean citizens to experience equal citizenship with descendants of slave owners, that the Caribbean was violently colonized, and that the Caribbean people still live with the trauma of that experience today. And central to their case is the assumption that given the damaging impact of enslavement, 
and colonialism, coupled with ongoing violent neoliberal social and economic policies, reparations is both a needed source of development finance and a matter of global social justice and human rights. So it was being put in a pressure cooker, being put in a pressure cooker, these Caribbean islands, that has led them to say, we are never going to get out of this situation. We're starting so far from behind. The whole extractivism for centuries that has happened, the whole exploitation that has happened for centuries, we will never get out of this. We need, therefore, to take a different approach, which is to demand reparations. So <clears throat> the Caribbean reparations case has gained significant traction regionally and globally and can be credited with catalyzing the present day reparations movement in Africa, Canada, the United States, Europe, and many other parts of the African diaspora. And so the next couple of slides that are coming through here are really a summary of what I just sort of presented about the significance of the economic and political factors uh, in the Caribbean that um, have caused them to launch and establish this case uh, for, for reparations. Um, so I just, just want to continue along in these slides here. Uh, this one says realizing the aid dollars are becoming less. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, maybe we can just back up. Yeah, well, we can leave that one there. We can leave that one there. Because some of the um, things that have happened to the Caribbean in the recent while is that through the World Trade Organization and, and, and you know, IMF and uh, International Monetary Fund and so forth, devaluing their dollar, um, you know, basically uh, the liberalization of trade. So things that they used to be able to survive on in terms of their, their, their treaties and, 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 and their, um, I guess, arrangements with their colonial nations, like for instance, the banana farming and so forth, like they would have specialized trading arrangements with Britain and so forth. These have all been thrown out of the window and they're not having any preferential, any preferential trade agreements anymore. Uh, there are markets where a lot of uh, Western companies would come and set up uh, financial uh, markets there. These are no longer under any kind of protectionism. These are wide open to large corporations here in North America who are undermining those, even their education. So there are a lot of offshore universities uh, competing with the one and only meager university that the Caribbean has, which is the University of West Indies. A lot of American schools are setting up for profit universities, undermining that infrastructure. And so there's there's very little that they have left to go on. The, the few little kernels that they kept from capitalist you know, exploitation uh, that were set up have now been totally throttled. And so they have no advantage in any market. All they have left is tourism. That's it. And so because of that, recognizing that they are so far behind because of the history and the legacy of enslavement, the Caribbean um, Reparations Commission, in their economic model for development, which is puts reparatory justice at the front, has devised what is called a 10 point plan for reparations. And that 10 point plan for reparations, it's very loosely uh, articulated at this stage, but it really does capture many of the, the, the critical things that have to happen in order to um, set the record uh, straight as far as being able to have some you know, basic uh, human rights um, in terms of education and health and, 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 and cultural value uh, in their countries. So I'm going to just walk through those 10 items of um, development plan of the Caribbean Reparations Commission. So they, the first one is a full formal apology um, and not statements of regret that we often hear. Second is that one of the things I should say too is that in their process of setting up a, a reparations commission in the Caribbean, all 15 countries that are part of the Caribbean Reparations Commission have commissions in their home host countries and they all have, the governments have set aside resources to do research 
uh, and gather the input from uh, everyday citizens on how they want to, what they would see in terms of reparatory justice as an economic model in the Caribbean. And one of the main stakeholders that, uh, who, that has been consulted is the Rastafarian community, uh, who have been some of the very first, uh, I guess, uh, civil society organized groups. They're considered more of a spiritual group or religion, but we'd say they come under uh, that domain. They were one of the first ones to uh, basically um, call for reparations. They've been calling for reparations for decades. And one of the key things that they have been calling for is repatriation um, to Africa. So pointing out the legal right of the descendants um, of Africa who were stolen from the lands and forcefully transferred here, that they've been calling for an opportunity if they so wish to return. And there've been negotiations and discussions already opened with uh, the nation of Ghana in terms of lands and, and people feel this would be an axiomatic uh, arrangement between the Caribbean and some countries in West Africa where people would like to go and return to the land. Um, they also have called for an Indigenous Peoples Development Program to rehabilitate survivors. Um, this is a, a very important one. Cultural institutions through which the stories of victims and their descendants can be told. Uh, attention to be paid to the public health crisis and we know about the social determinants of health. We are all going through this pandemic right now. And when 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 the COVID-19 virus first, you know, you know, reared its head upon the globe, we were saying out of the World Health Organization and all kinds of other entities, this virus does not discriminate. Everybody's equally susceptible to being, you know, uh, taken down by this virus. But we knew very before very long into this pandemic, we saw that that wasn't true, that there are social determinants that make some communities more vulnerable uh, than others. And so public health, based on your economic status and information and education, these things all play into, you know, the overall health profile of people in the Caribbean, the high rates of, uh, you know, chronic diseases like diabetes and uh, these kinds and stress profiles associated uh, with that. And, and it's, it's interesting that I was in uh, Barbados for a lecture uh, with Dr. Hilary Beckles. He was delivering an, an annual lecture there at the University of the West Indies. And he talked about the sugar trade in the Caribbean, which is how the West was won through sugar. This is how you know, Europe gained its riches through the sugar trade. And he talked about the legacy of that in terms of how people think about what to eat as a diet. And he talked about, as a child, remembering being on the school ground. And people would have little brown bags. You know the little brown bags you would get with candy when you're a kid? Little brown bags with sugar, with white sugar as a snack. Can you imagine? You know. That when you're brought up thinking, because that's what was there, that, that sugar was king, sugar was queen, and you know, syrupy drinks and all of these things factor into people's uh, health profile. And these habits, you know, are intergenerationally transmitted, and it takes it takes a lot of work to to unlearn these these bad health habits. So he talks about the public health crisis in the Caribbean, uh, and he feels that the fact there was a, a plantation uh, nation a complete plantocracy this has had a profound effect not uh, in terms of stress and uh, high blood pressure and diabetes and you know consumption of uh, the lesser parts of uh, animal proteins that uh, cause high cholesterol and so forth and and these are all part of the, the demands so we'll just go to the next slide eradicating illiteracy um, as the Black and Indigenous communities were left, you know, without any infrastructure either, you know, in terms of schools, uh, colleges, or universities. And we're living in an information economy right now. And, you know, the in the Caribbean still, they're operating the old British 
uh, GCE system and there's not enough schools that every child can really get a full secondary education. They're still writing common entrance exams to determine and the screening is so systemic because there's only capacity for so many in, in students to go on to what they call O level and A level college, which is the preparatory uh, path in the pipeline to uh, professional careers in the pipeline to university and skill and, and uh, more skilled and technical uh, abilities that are needed to compete in today's economy. So that, you know, each of these islands and those 15 countries could all use another three to four uh, A-level colleges. I mean, it's just unthinkable here in Canada that at the age of 11 or 12, which would be the end of uh, elementary is when these students they sit that that we would have our kids sitting to write an exam a common entrance exam to determine which school they get to go to and clearly because there's only one school that is a pipeline to the uh, higher level uh, educational background that if your child doesn't get you know the the scores then they get funneled off and siphoned off to schools that are basically training them for a life of of a uh, servitude in the capitalist market of whether they end up working in, in, in tourist industry or those kinds of things that serve us here in North America who are still pillaging and who are still extracting um, from those countries. Um, an African knowledge program to teach people about their culture and history is another very important one that has been, you know, if you, if you even though those are, the, you go to the Caribbean, uh, the and they're all black countries, very low uh, European settler population there. Um, if you look in, at the textbooks, and I have gone into the schools there and I, I, I had an opportunity to be there for a year and travel throughout the Caribbean and engage with people there and go into the schools and cultural centers and, and work with some of the educators and review some of their textbooks. I went there with that in mind. And, you know, if you look at the history and social studies textbooks, even though these are all black countries, the colonial mentality and narrative of subordination is, is clear because this was the whole education system was set up by the British and the students writing, they have to, if they're writing uh, the their, their British exam, the British common entrance exam, then they have to learn all about the Eurocentric world in order to pass. So it's only in recent times that the uh, same organization, the Caribbean, uh, the CARICOM organization, where they've begun to try to take control of their education and have uh, a common exam and to rewrite their curriculum to reflect uh, the African peoples of the Caribbean. So these are all the kinds of things that are happening in terms of uh, psychological dislocation of people. Uh, technology transfer is another one that has been identified as an important tenant of a 10 point plan for reparations and development. And the one that I like is a debt cancellation to address the fiscal entrapment. And this is exactly how they've gotten to this, this stage is that they've been fiscally entrapped by the centuries, <clears throat> centuries of marginalization, centuries of extractivism that have caused this situation. And that in the, and, and, then, and then just being put on, <clears throat> A roller coaster of of debt through through aid and so debt cancellation and when you think of the amount of money 40 percent of the budget of england to pay people to pay the slave owners because they felt we're losing our property you know and yet when the discussions are now coming to the table about debt cancellation the you know, governing uh, bodies in England and France and in and, and all of the countries that participated in this are, are like turning a blind eye when you think of the difference, 40% that you paid them, but not wanting to cancel the debt of these nations that are fiscally entrapped. So, uh, yeah. So I say, I, I take you through this, you know, sort of, you know, long, uh, uh, political history and 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 more more of a contemporary political history of the Caribbean, because of the fact that it is through their bravery and economic foresight that they have 
decided to bring forward this legal claim that they intend to take to the United Nations, which their first option and course of action is to negotiate with these countries, with the colonial nations, to make these reparations without going through the court battle. And so it's because these 15 English speaking Caribbean nations have led on this issue is why we are here having the debate, the debate today in the whole African diaspora about reparatory justice because they were pushed to the wall. And as a result of their work, reparations is now a global movement engaging the majority of the African diaspora. And that's quite phenomenal and quite the departure. And I think most people who do sit and have conversation and listen and, and uh, listen to um, network television and so forth may not be aware that the impetus for this present day, you know, um, revitalization of this conversation really began with the tiny 15 islands of the Caribbean and not the big bad hole of the US or even us here in Canada. Uh, so I'm going to move us now to, uh, let's move to the, yeah, so that's sort of like setting us up for talking about the Canadian context of reparatory justice. How do we enter this conversation? Now that you've got the more global uh, backdrop as to how this topic has gotten uh, so much coverage right now. And of course, the fact that we have the decade of people of African descent uh, has also shed a lot of light on the history of people of African descent and has caused the conversation of reparations to come up. And also in 2001, there was a United Nations anti-racism conference in Durban, South Carolina. And that, and that conference, one of the, 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 the beginnings of conversation, somewhat also led by a number of Caribbean nations, they, was to get the issue of reparations on the UN agenda. And this was in, in uh, South Africa, and it was a major uh, political ploy to keep it off the agenda. And they did win at that conference to get it on the agenda. They did. But unfortunately, we all know what shock, shocked what reverberated around the world in 2001 was America, uh, you know, became the victim of the 9-11 uh, world towers collapsing based on the, that particular act that, that occurred. And so a lot of the international agendas just sort of were swept away and, and priorities were rearranged. And so it, the, it, it just disappeared. It just disappeared between 2001 until recently. And so now uh, the conversation is making its way back. But one good thing that did come out of that conference was the formation of an organization called the Global African Congress. The World Global African Congress was established and their prime reason for coming into being in 2001 during that time, that conference, was to take up the issue of reparatory justice, to be able to uh, work with uh, all nations where African people live to get them to agitate for, to learn, study, research, and then form reparations commissions to be able to tackle this issue of reparatory justice. So it's only now after 20 years that it's beginning to find its way back. And it got a real bump and a real shot in the arm from the uh, actions of the Caribbean nations in 2015. And we in Canada, not that far away from the, 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 the nexus of conversation, we had people from here in Nova Scotia that attended that uh, conference in Durban, South Africa in 2001. And we have people here in Nova Scotia that are intimately connected and involved in the debate with those folks involved in the work in the Caribbean and have invited people from the Caribbean Reparations Commission here to Canada, here to Nova Scotia, and keeping us here uh, as a part of a, the global debate. We may be tiny uh, and off the beaten track here in Nova Scotia, but we are quite plugged in to, to this conversation of reparatory justice right here at home. And so um, I wanna just take the next while 
getting through the Canadian context or the case for uh, reparations. I'm just going to go back to that one, that slide that's there in front. Yeah. So in terms of the Canadian context, um, there, there is a, I'm just going to read from some of the, 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 the notes that I prepared. C currently, there's a new, as I just said, an emerging discourse and approach to uh, African Canadian economic development. We're, we're, we're taking it, we're like the Caribbean, we're taking a new look too to say how are we ever going to get ourselves out of the entrapment as well. Now that, and so we're, we're thinking about it differently as well. Uh, and this has been, as I say, ushered in, this new discourse is being ushered in by the whole conversation, the global conversation on preparatory justice and the new social change theories that are being advanced by reparation scholars like Dr. Beckles, like folks like Tahanishi Coates as a journalist who's doing this work, like Dr. Derry out of the uh, Southern United States, and like so many others that are doing this work, and they're challenging Eurocentric narratives of what transpired. Uh, this is Blacks here in Canada. We are challenging the Euro Eurocentric narratives of the 400 years since we first arrived here in Canada. Um, and this paradigm, uh, and it doesn't just stop with people just, you know, having these conversations at the level of ideology, because often reparation scholars are by and large activist scholars, which means that we're kind of simultaneously challenging historic academic, academic narratives, while at the same time challenging, you know, the world around us, the institutions we interact with, the government, the corporations, is, and, you know, local global leaders um, who are benefiting from um, what happened to us over the last 400 years. So myself as someone who, I don't know, I guess I would consider myself maybe an emerging, uh, 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 I wouldn't say scholar, but an emerging uh, interest in this topic. Uh, I'm just going to share what I think in terms of some of the theories that I'm trying to put together, a few critical perspectives about how things are happening here in Canada. And I'm going to use an African Nova Scotian lens to highlight my points. And, and honestly, my choice to use uh, a Black Nova Scotian political lens is not just because I'm from here in Nova Scotia, but rather because Nova Scotia is the historic, historic mecca and genesis of the Black experience in Canada by virtue of the fact of having the longest history of settlement here. Um, and even though the population of the of Black people in Nova Scotia is smaller than the Black population in Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and even Manitoba, Nova Scotia is home to the oldest Black communities in Canada and the largest communities of what we say is Indigenous Blacks who have been in Canada since the mid 1700s. So by way of a brief background on the, for those of us joining who may not be as familiar, I just want to take you through a little bit about uh, the first major group of Black arrivals to this province. Um, they are widely known as the Black Loyalists, because if we look at the, at the story of the Black Loyalists, that builds our case for reparatory justice, if you think of it. They were given this title of Black Loyalists because they answered a proclamation issued by the British warrior governor John Murray. Earl of Dunsmore, who offered freedom to enslaved Blacks who would be daring enough to desert their slave owners to join the British Army during the American War of Independence, which began in 1775. Dunmore referred to this army of freedom-seeking Black soldiers as his Ethiopian regiment. However, as history has taught us, the British lost that war and America gained its independence from Britain. With that, the Earl of Dunsmore had to make good on his contract for freedom to his Ethiopian regiment that he had promised. So as a result, in 1783, Dunsmore's Black Loyalist soldiers were mustered up and resettled in Nova Scotia. Some 3,500 Blacks came, creating the largest settlement of free Blacks in the British Empire at that time. But what research sheer, clearly shows is that unlike the Scottish or the British, the French, the German and others who came to Nova Scotia to 
unrightfully occupy the lands of indigenous nations. For people of African descent who came to Nova Scotia, ours was not a mission of discovery or expansionism or quest for religious and economic self-actualization. The story of Africans arriving in Nova Scotia, Canada for that matter, is not a story of pilgrims freely and willingly boarding ships to venture across the Atlantic Ocean unbonded, unindentured, and unbounded. But rather, for Africans arriving in Canada, ours is a story about the quest for freedom from chattel slavery and cultural genocide. Ours is a story of a masterfully minded escape plan that involved calculated risk and the possibility of a brutal death at the hands of slave catchers and bounty hunters if all did not go as planned. African Nova Scotian settlement was a search for a promised land. But after all of our loyalty and fighting wars for the British, after we arrived in our so-called promised land, we were cheated out of our citizenship, our human dignity, and our true freedom, especially our economic freedom. Uh, this was done in many ways, but four of them stand out and are now the subject of great discussion and debate as grounds for launching a case for reparations for Blacks in Nova Scotia. And I've got these four items that I have identified as part of my research that I feel are clear, clearly speak to the inequities that profoundly, profoundly uh, can substantiate a case for reparations. First one is systemic racial discrimination of land granting by the British when the refugees of that war arrive. The systemic racial exploitation of black labor once people were here. The fact that we had separate and unequal schooling and school segregation is a third. And also the systemic social exclusion, which in the United States they would say Jim Crow, we didn't use that term here as much, but it's exactly the very same thing. So let me start with saying a little bit about the first one, about the land grants. Now, land ownership, I really, we know, is a pipeline to prosperity. When the land is equally shared by all human beings, we can all eat, you know, a uh, living for ourselves, you know, and be able to survive. But we know that if people don't are landless, they cannot provide for themselves. We know that. We see what is happening to First Nations people and how they have been, you know, put in a, in a state of impoverishment by cleaning their land, putting them on reserve land. So we know that, that the, the uh, encroachment on lands, that the outright theft of land and the control of land, because the land is needed to feed yourself. And in those times, the largely agricultural times of 1783, you know, the, the, the way that we move food through the capitalist systems of distribution today did not exist. So you needed land absolutely to have any kind of uh, way to support yourself. Land ownership is a pipeline of prosperity. The Black loyalists, which was the largest group of Blacks forced uh, blacks forced to settle in Nova Scotia is a prime example of unequal land granting. The British had promised free land and rations for three years to the black loyalists. Um, a family was supposed to receive 100 acres for each family head and 50 acres for each person in the household it would be the spouse, I mean, the, the wife, the son or daughter, or, or servants. Each military officer was to receive a thousand acres and a private was to receive a hundred acres, but that never happened for the black loyalists. Of the black loyalists who did make claim in the records show in the 
the Nova Scotian archives, out of the 649 black men that did apply, only 187 of them received land grants at all. Those who served in the black pioneer militia companies received very little land and in many cases, none. And the blacks who came after the loyalists, after the wars of westward expansion in the war of 1812, who are called the black refugees, they had a similar fate and they were settled on land uh, in communities, if you know, uh, if you're in the Nova Scotia context, uh, communities such as here in the metropolitan Halifax area, Beachville, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, Lake Loon, Cherrybrook, East Preston, North Preston, places um, in Guysborough County uh, as well as Truro, and they were always put on the outskirts. Uh, they were given lands that were uh, not suitable for agriculture and far away from economic activity. So the whole unequal land granting was very much a part of keeping Black people here impoverished. The second one I have is the exploitation of Black labor. The question is, who reaped the benefit of Black labor in this province? Okay, and The Black labor, uh, first of all, there was three classes of Blacks in Nova Scotia simultaneously. There were Blacks here who were free because they fought in Dunsmore's War. So they arrived in, in 1783. And of course, there was still slavery in British uh, empire in 1783. So they had to make good on that. They were somewhat free. They were able to move about, but always being, um, you know, monitored. So there were black, there were free blacks, but there was also uh, indentured blacks. And there were still white loyalists who came here who brought their enslaved blacks with them and blacks who came through other means. So there were three classes of blacks here. So black labor was very much utilized to help build uh, this province. Uh, many people may not know, and they have a tiny little plaque up in the British fortress of Citadel Hill that's called the Maroon Bastion, a little plaque there, because the another group of people who came here as who were exiled here from Jamaica were the Maroons. And the Maroons were given the task to build Citadel Hill under the uh, direction of the British. So our labor was used to fortify uh, this place uh, either as enslaved labor or as uh, indentured labor. Um, the enslaved labor, these is a lot of prominent examples. Uh, for instance, in the 1700s, the New England planters came here where blacks toiled the fields of uh, the uh, southern part of the province for as, as enslaved laborers. Uh, and as I said, the Maroons who built Citadel Hill and also the, the French who had the Blacks to build the Fortress Louisbourg by the French. So there are so many, and we need more research to gather up more of these stories of the exploitation of Black labor to build Nova Scotia. And in fact, one of the examples I always like to share is what happened uh, in uh, Brookstown when the Blacks first settled there. When the Black Loyalists came, that was the first settlement that they were placed was in Birchtown. And because their labor was so pretty much next to nothing cheap, the white workers in the area were, were inflamed because they were losing out on opportunities to do uh, skilled labor jobs because you know the uh, landowners would hire or have on for next to nothing the cheaper black labor. And the white settlers of Birchtown were so incensed that they burned down uh, several, I mean, about 20 homes and was and had a riot and was deemed to be the first race riot in North America, where they burned and looted, uh, they burned and looted uh, Birchtown. So uh, that's an example right there. And there's another poignant example. We all know the story of, of, of a servant woman named Lydia Jackson, who was a black loyalist, lived in Guysborough County. And what happened to her is because she was not able to read or write, the owners took advantage of her and signed her into a 39-year contract of indentureship. And when many of the Blacks left Nova Scotia 
1796 to try to start a new life in Freetown, Sierra Leone through the Freetown Company. This is why we know about the, uh, the story of Lydia Jackson. She was attempting to go and she found out she couldn't because she was indentured for 39 years. And a, a, a philanthropist uh, took her case on and then went before the courts. And that's why we have such accurate records of what happened to her. So that's just one that came forward. There's so many more stories like this that need to be uncovered. Uh, and so that, that sort of cemented the uh, way in which black labor is even used today. It's still black labor is not valued as much as mainstream or white labor. We're still undervalued and underpaid. Uh, and this is something, again, like in, Saint, like in the Caribbean, it's a, le a, le a legacy of enslavement, a legacy of enslavement. Um, second example that I, I want to give, or third example I want to give, is these separate and unequal schooling based on race or school segregation. Everyone here should, if you have not seen it before, should watch the film by Dr. Sylvia Hamilton called The Little Black School Host. It is probably, not probably, it is unequivocally the, the most well, best researched um, piece of work on school segregation in Nova Scotia, which didn't end until 1954. And some of the conditions that were put up that if you were a black community and you wanted to have a school, you had to raise a certain amount of money before the government would match that for you to get a school. So a lot of the times what would happen if you had a few people in the community that were literate, they would just hold school in, in the little churches, in the community churches. So for years, there was no access to uh, education, to, to schooling for Black people. And we know right to this day, uh, the stories are many. If I had more time to go into that, the separate and unequal schools uh, of a generation ago have had a huge impact on the present day educational underachievement and the achievement gap um, of, of black students. And this spills over into the economic opportunities because if you don't acquire the education, then you also can't compete in this knowledge economy. We are all uh, agree that education is essential. Uh, you know, you have to gain those skills to be uh, self-sufficient you know, economically and be able to, to, to survive. Um, I'll just say though that, you know, there are some changes, so this isn't a story of all gloom and doom, so that some things, and this is sort of, I mentioned it because it's like, we won't use the word reparations here in Canada. We don't like to, to say that. But in 1994, when the Black Report was tabled, which was the result of a three-year study into educational inequities, there were many things named to redress the fact of the inequalities in education and a number of uh, programs and services were set up around financing for like bursaries and scholarships for black students and setting up an African services branch in the Nova Scotia Department of Education and for a time we did have blacks on school boards in designated seats but we all know that the school boards in total were wiped away by one of the governments and that's to the detriment I think of public input into education um, but there is so much more that needs to be done beyond the programs that we see that are cropping up at the universities and so forth. And, uh, and I'm kind of like a Bernie Saunders in the sense that I think that uh, free university education ought to be given to any black child that can make it through the public school system because it is not easy. It's like walking through a landmine. Okay. Uh, if they can make it through a public school system with a grade 12 that can get them into the university, this province and this country owes them a free university education, a free community college education, or a free skilled education in the trades or whatever else that they need uh, as a result of what has happened historically. The last one I want to mention is systemic social exclusion. Uh, even when racial segregation was not prescribed by law in some places as like Jim Crow or in Southern or, or in South African apartheid, um, we have to be in mind that um, informal policies of systemic exclusion serve the same purpose of denying citizens equal rights and freedoms. And without going 
uh, much further to that, I think the most familiar example of racial discrimination in services would be in the areas of housing, healthcare, the justice system, uh, government service, social services. Uh, blacks could not, you know, go into barbershops, certain stores, movie theaters. Did I say movie theaters? Yeah, I said movie theaters. And everybody's mind just went bling, 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 uh, Viola Desmond. And I think that that, the fact that, you know, when you pick up that purple $10 note with her picture on it, you know, that says it all that Canada did have, you know, uh, a system of social exclusion where she could not go to the movie theater and sit in the seat that she wanted to, to sit in and that she was arrested and for a penny fee, uh, you know, charged falsely. And this government had to pardon her um, and make amends. So, which is good that we've done that. That is a form of reparatory justice, making good like that. But the Violet Desmond case is, is one of the most high, high profile cases of legal segregation and uh, systemic uh, racial social exclusion in, in uh, Nova Scotia. And, and I think probably the, the next highest one I just will just briefly mention is the whole story of Africville and what happened to, to Africville and the destruction of that community. And, it's just in, and how everything conspired based on racialized uh, uh, ways of dealing with people of African descent that you know resulted in the complete demise and raising of that community. And the fact that there's so much intergenerational trauma from what happened to the people who lived in Africa. And we know this happens in housing. I can remember sitting with uh, people um, a couple of examples, and two of these examples are very highly noted people in the African Nova Scotia community. One of them was the brother of Portia White, who told me his personal story uh, about the fact that he had to get uh, a white couple to pose for them to be able to go put an offer on a host that he wanted to buy here in central Halifax. And that's how he got his host in the 1960s, because he knew that they would not sell to him. And another is example is the story of uh, the author of the book, The Black Battalion, uh, Dr. Calvin Ruck, the late Dr. Calvin Ruck, who, you know, bought a house in Dartmouth in, in the 60s and had a cross burned on his lawn. And there's so many other stories like this that we have to research to be able to, uh, I mean, I, I just think that building a case for reparatory justice in Nova Scotia is an easy thing to do. We just need to be able to put forward example after example after example, because the stories are there. They need to be documented. And one of the things going back to the Caribbean that they're doing through the Caribbean Reparations Commission with the University of, of West Indies, they have established a, a, a center for reparations research at the University of West Indies at the campus in Jamaica. And so they have enlisted and engaged scholars and PhD and graduate student, master's students to be able to do the research that is needed so that we can put together the kind of case for reparations that's needed. Now, it's not that we have to convince people that slavery happened, we know that happened. But if we're talking about reparations, we wanna be accurate. So we need to do that kind of work to see how much money was paid to these British slave owners. And what was that worth in, in today's money? How much black labor in Nova Scotia was exploited? You know, and what is that worth in today's money? So we need researchers to get these stories. Yes, to put a dollar figure on what has to be invested and injected in these marginalized black communities across Nova Scotia and Canada and the whole African diaspora. Um, so there, with that said, as we come down to uh, a close, just trying to make that close the loop there on the, on the parallels between what the Caribbean Reparations Commission of CARICOM has done to, to, to uh, create this debate globally and how we in Nova Scotia have found our way into that debate globally. Um, and as a result, part of the work that I'm doing in falling in line with um, what they have done, just for the sake of trying to advance the conversation, for the sake of trying to advance the debate 
here in Nova Scotia and advance the conversation. Um, I have uh, postulated a 10 point plan for reparations for black Nova Scotians. Uh, so reparations and development, the African Nova Scotian 10 point plan, which borrows heavily from the model of the Caribbean reparations plan. So a, again, a full formal apology, uh, as opposed to regrets uh, is, is another one. Um, I'm not seeing, I think something happened on that slide. I don't know if I can move it over. I can't see all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll just trudge along. A full formal apology as opposed to statements of regrets. Uh, and then it's showing three, like something disappeared. But the, an African, an Afrocentric research-based rehab uh, program to address the psychological dislocation. And this could look like healing programs, counseling, self-knowledge programs no, um, uh, to learn about African Nova Scotian history and roots. We go to the next slide. So we can advance to the next slide for that. Number two, uh, I think that African Nova Scotians, because they did not get the land grants that were that were uh, promised to them in the so-called promised land, that land grants, but I feel this has to be done in consultation with the Aboriginal community um, and with the blessing of the Aboriginal community. Land grants would allow African Nova Scotia to establish a measure of economic independence. Uh, the critical aspect of this action is that the, the land uh, African Nova Scotians didn't receive and, and the little bit that we did receive is being encroached upon and stolen and taken away um, through trickery and in, in today's sort of um, uh, real estate moguls who are encroaching on black communities everywhere. Go on to the next one. So here we go. That's, that's where it is. An Afrocentric research-based re, re, rehabilitation program to address the psychological dislocation of enslavement. And I mentioned that before, but somehow it had gotten mixed in with the previous slide. So we can skip right to number four. Similar to the Caribbean. Oh, to number four, we go back to number four. Cultural institutions, museums, and programs that document the culture, the music, the art, and the stories of African descended people. Uh, be done by expanding. We, we could do some of this by ex expanding some of the existing uh, entities that we already have, like we do have a black culture center. We do have a, a black loyalist museum after many, many years of we finally have this. We do have a music association, you know, some, but many of these things that we have are under resourced. Uh, we do need an African Nova Scotian art center and many other institutions. We mean, that's how you maintain culture, you know, when you go out about the place in any city and you go into its museums and you go into its parks and you go into all the public spaces, what we continually see is the perpetuation of European triumphalism. You know, whether it's the statutes, which we are now slowly taking down, or whether it's the art that is sitting in the art gallery of Nova Scotia or in the Museum of Natural History or the Fisherman's Museum, uh, Wherever we go, the Museum of the Atlantic, you know, Citadel Hill, uh, Lewisburg, what we're seeing is again a a a psychological dislocation, taking people who are not European off their terms to valorize the history of European oppressors. Number five, we just know, is again the African note health. We also very much like the Caribbean, although we're in a, you know, what's quote unquote, a developed nation, a very affluent nation. Uh, despite that, uh, African Nova Scotians uh, are not uh, as equally benefiting from those resources in terms of our health profiles, our health profiles in terms of um, diabetes, cholesterol issues, blood pressure issues, obesity, uh, stress, uh, these are all social determinants of health, which are the legacy of enslavement, and that we are overrepresented in, in these, and also mental health 
as well is very important. Our nutritional experience, uh, the emotional brutality and stress that has, is associated with slavery, genocide, and apartheid, intergenerational trauma, and the epigenetics that you know basically you know causes us to to uh, suffer uh, disproportionately in in terms of our health. Go to the next one. An independent, uh, Afrocentric or African-centered education and research program initiative would include things such as Afrocentric schools, Afrocentric immersion programs in our secondary schools and in elementary schools, special initiatives and special uh, professional opportunities for especially in those fields where African Nova Scotians are grossly underrepresented. You know, I, when you think, you know, I don't, I can't say that I know a black physiotherapist or occupational therapist or audiologist, uh, people, you know, to hum communicate for us working in, in the, the media, because you know that we are living in, a, in an information age and people to tell our stories and tell them accurately. So communications people, um, why are we, you know, benefiting in certain roles like tourism management, hospitality science, apprentice? So there are so many ways in which the education system uh, is not uh, delivering fairly to people of African descent. Again, that achievement gap is the legacy of enslavement. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, an African spirituality center to research and learn about African spiritual practices and ritual culture. This is really important because we have to decolonize the church. We have to decolonize, as someone heard someone say, decolonize Jesus. Because essentially, you know, that image of a white man and in the Last Supper, growing up all my life, going to church and seeing that, that that is psychologically damaging that you feel that your own soul and if you believe in a higher power if you believe in that kind of connectivity uh spiritually that that you can't even think about it when you close your eyes to pray that you don't see an image that is that is made in your own image that doesn't happen for a lot of people because they are constantly assaulted and bombarded with images that cause the othering of people of African descent, even whilst they pray. So there's a lot to be learned uh, about what are the spiritual practices of people of African descent. And we know precious little about them. There are some things that we do that come from the intergenerational transfer of certain spiritual ways of being and ways of knowing that we can't set uh, a definition to because we haven't rightly been able to uh, gather the, the history and the stories uh, or to even connect to our motherland. It's another one of my private passions as a reparations uh, activist as opposed to scholar. Not only should every African Nova Scotian uh, person who comes out of high school be guaranteed a education, post-secondary education, but they should also be should they choose be able to similar to what the Rastafarians want but repatriation is that they should be given an opportunity all expense paid to go to Africa and experience the culture for a month or so to reconnect I know myself the when I took my daughters you know it was just transformative for them and I think the earlier we take them the sooner and the better because we see so many negative images of Africa, you know, all the time. Um, and I don't need to enumerate them. I think we know what they all are. And so I think that being able to uh, have a first experience, first voice, uh, and to be there on the ground would, I think, be psychologically transformative for uh, people of African descent. And this could be developed in partnership with uh, organizations who have been doing work like this. Uh, there was an organization, well, it's COVID now, so no one can go anywhere, called Connecting to Africa, where they would take cohorts of students 
in, and sometimes people of all ages to West Africa to be able to work on projects and experience the culture and, and go through that process of self-discovery. We'll just go to that. We've just got uh, two more left. Invest in a province-wide economic development plan, creating a comprehensive infrastructure to include housing, community sustainability, investment in African Nova Scotia business development, and investment in technology for, um, you know, be able to the world's science and technology and technology culture. So this is really important, and I, I say this with a with a with a forked tongue. I say this with a forked tongue because. The economic development plan that we uh, need to work toward has to really uh, deconstruct the capitalist economy and the political economy of capitalism. And that if we're just going to sign on to the system that put us in this situation that we're in today, that oppressed us as it is today, then we're not really advancing the greater cause of ourself or humanity. So that we do all need to earn a living and we, we have to participate in some kind of system of, of, of exchange of goods and services, but capitalism isn't the only way, you know, neoliberalism isn't the only way to be able to engage in a market. And I think that that is very critical. And that is something that um, I think will come to a lot of, of theorizing and a lot of spiritual groundings with with how we see ourselves going forward uh in the future and then the last one we'll go to the last one and what do you think that one is to number 10. of course debt cancellation to address the wealth gap faced by african nova scotians this would include cancellation of everything student loan debt wish someone had done that for me business loan debt you know ownership mortgage debt there needs to be a platform, something designed, a, a, a strategy designed around debt cancellation for people of African descent. And that's something that I can, that we could take a whole another lecture on, but I just put these, these 10 points for further discussion, further debate, further consideration, argument, whatever, on the whole notion of a 10 point uh, plan or reparatory justice for people of African descent. And then um, as I close, there's two small things that I want to say, because I did say in my learning objectives that, you know, the question of who was responsible for making reparations. And I didn't want to uh, put that up without saying something about it. And essentially, this is just a list, what I'm having here, because I think that you know, from all of the literature research and the conversations, both qualitative and quantitative, that what seems to be the consensus that all colonial governments that enslaved African peoples, British, French, Belgium, you know, uh, Germany, uh, you know, Spain, Portugal, all of those nations, uh, they absolutely are responsible for making reparations. They are. But also, so are corporations. Especially, think of how the Western culture that we have and the, and the economic affluence that we have. It started out in the agricultural industry with bananas, sugar, tobacco, sharecropping, cotton. So the agricultural corporations, they have gone on and bloomed on and, and they are now, you know, and that's why we need to do the research to see, you know, the Fortune 500 country uh, co uh, companies that we see today, where did they get their money from? Where did they get their start? What part of their money came from slave, from slaveholding and hold these, these companies uh, accountable? Mining companies, mining companies. Think of South Africa, think of Botswana. Think of all these places where, where black people, you know, uh, you know, decode these these precious minerals uh, for use and exchange in the aggrandizement of European nations. 
the financial industry is another huge one that needs to pay reparations. The entertainment industry, that's happening right now. I mean, we know that the exploitation of, of, of blackness, exploitation of black, black likeness is, is prevalent uh, in the, uh, in the indus music industry, in the entertainment industry overall. Um, and we also have to look at these, as I call them, I named them the economic overseers. I mean, it's just basically a new form of a whip in hand which is the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. They have been the ones to create the structures to keep people entrenched in impoverished in the way that they have done, not just in the Caribbean, but in the, in the continent of Africa and right down to you know, the communities here uh, in terms of black folks here. Private citizens, you know, there are a lot of wealthy people a lot of wealthy people, and we have to question where do their wealth come from. Here in Canada, we all levels of government. You know, Nova Scotia has a very unique profile in terms of reparatory justice, because in one sense, the people of African descent here, they could have claimed, it's very interesting, because of the French, the British, but also the United States, because of our being there, as well as here in Nova Scotia, as well in Canada. So there's like four different um, uh, entities or governments or, or countries that, four different countries, I would say, that we have to uh, negotiate with or take the task or bring forth our claims with. And um, Last but not least, I do want to say one thing. There's one more slide. Is that all this that we are debating and, and will grow in this debate over time, I know, all of this has to incorporate a deeper appreciation, a deeper reflection, a deeper analysis before we begin to even move forward, because there have to be some underlying and guiding spiritual, philosophical principles uh, and ethics around how we would pursue any claim for reparations. And first and foremost among that is that we as African people here, while we are advancing our own claim, we can't be so single-minded and myopic to ignore the fact that we are living here on unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So first, before we can do anything about our situation, we have to acknowledge the history of genocide of indigenous peoples, number one. And that our, because this 1492, we we're all got in this together. They had their lands taken over. And, in a complete genocide against them. We were also extracted from Africa and brought here as, as enslaved labor. And so when they teach 1492 in school, they need to put the, the year in the middle and the people around the year. And everybody has a different narrative because the narrative of indigenous peoples and the narrative of people of African descent is not that triumphant narrative that is taught in schools of how these great people came as pilgrims and so forth and settled the land and toiled and, and got you know got away from the potato farming potato famine and built nova scotia and built canada that's one narrative but we need the other narratives so first as people of african descent acknowledge the history of genocide of indigenous peoples acknowledge that african nova scotians are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory Acknowledge the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and acknowledge the role Indigenous peoples have played in supporting survival of early African Nova Scotian freedom seekers and refugee slaves. There's a lot of uh, folk uh, uh, oral history about the survival of, of Black Nova Scotians being left out in the barrens in what is now called North Preston 
And these stories have traveled down from generation to generation that they were left to freeze and die if it weren't for the neighboring First Nations peoples that taught them how to survive on the land, they, they would have perished. So these are very important pieces of work that need to be researched um, as well. And then the last, the very last, last one is that we need to adopt an Afrocentric theoretical framework to undergird and underpin reparations, philosophy, research, strategies, and proposals. Because a reparatory, I mean, justice uh, claim without African people putting their worldview at the center and giving agency to themselves, they have an Afrocentric perspective. If we don't have that, we will not be able to gain and prosper in a way that we would want. Because if we're just going to sign on to Eurocentric thinking, to capitalistic thinking, I mean, we have to put, when we talk about reparations, we must not only put capitalism, we, you know, we have to put capitalism on trial, not just slavery on trial, right? Because it was the start of capitalism that landed us where we are. So we can't then turn around and buy into that system. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's host. So we can't, we can't use the master's tools and think that they will somehow equal good for us. We have to find an alternative model of, of doing things. And so we have to find a non-Eurocentric way of doing things. So we have to put our needs and our and give agency to ourselves from an Afrocentric theoretical framework in all that we do. So we'll go to the last slide. Oh, and it says, thank you. The last slide says, thank you. And the last slide says, are there any questions if anyone's still awake? Uh, because that, that was quite longer than I planned. I hadn't timed it. Um, I've done lectures in other contexts. Sometimes I do a lot of panels, and those are really short. But then I also did do some sessional teaching at St. Mary's uh, on this topic, and of course, those classes are about two hours long. So I cut some out to make it less than two hours. But as you can see, we did go quite long, long enough to. I hope people took a break. They really do. <laughs> Delvina, Thank I, you for I, listening. Thank you. Okay, Delvina. I, I there are two uh, registered questions and a number of comments in the chat. Uh, line that you may wish to look at later. Um, the first question goes back to something you started with at the very beginning when you were talking about the Black Loyalists. And it says, I'm curious uh, as to why the Black Loyalists are referred to as Ethiopian soldiers in particular. Yeah, well, interesting. I think that in, your, in the European context, you know, the term Ethiopian or Ethiopes, and of course it's also very much ingrained from biblical texts, was a term that was widely used to characterize anyone who was black skinned. And um, that's kind of where that comes from. So um, he referred to them as his Ethiopian regiment, not that they were from Ethiopia in terms of its geographical uh, location. These were enslaved people that came from West Africa. Uh, but I think it largely comes from that whole uh, historical uh, uh, reference of referring to pe black skinned people as as Ethiopes, as Ethiopians. Okay, um, the uh, the second registered question, uh, no, I had another one pop up here. Uh, it starts with a comment and I'll just uh, parse it uh, here. It's, uh, I was pleased to hear about the, uh, the work in Upper Hammonds Plains to create a community land trust. Uh, in this way, more Black Nova Scotians could become homeowners. They could be better uh, better afford to buy a house uh, with the land remaining in the community uh, as uh, community ownership. This would help reduce the cost uh, of home purchase. Reparations might include transfer of government-owned lands to community land trusts in Black communities. So perhaps you wanted to comment on that. Wonderful comment. Love that comment. It's a conversation that, <clears throat> sorry. It's a, it's a conversation that has, is really going on right now. And there is a organization that is doing some work and they're calling it themselves the road to prosperity. <clears throat> and uh, 
they are leading a lot of conversation and community consultation on the issue of land. A number of communities, Hammonds Plains being one of them, Beachville, Lake Loon, and many of the, the communities near the, metro, the metropolitan area where land is being hotly sought after, um, people have, a couple of things are happening. People, some people don't have clear title to their land to be able to be able to develop it the way they want. And then in some situations, very similar to Af Africville, where people would come in and try to bribe people out of their land, uh, as one of the lines in uh, the film about Africville, where uh, a woman gets up and gives her rent, and she says, they took us out in the city garbage trucks, and then they brought in money. And what's $500 to a black mm -hmm. man? He thinks he's rich. Point being that they would bribe people, make them feel if you've never had anything and someone offers you uh, something that looks like might be a pretty penny for your land, then what's happening, a lot of people are selling the lands out. So these ideas of community land trust really go to the whole notion of keeping the land in the community of people who are selling the lands of black people who do own some land, encouraging them to be a part of a land trust that if they have land to sell that they would sell it to the land trust and the land trust would then in turn, you know, find people from the black community who might want to live in that community. And it's not is that and some people say, oh, is that a form of segregation? Absolutely not. What we're talking about here is that when you have communities, you have culture. And when you have people dispersed, then you lose the culture. So the impetus for wanting to maintain these communities um, is to be able to maintain one's culture. And uh, and I say, and also to get people wise to the fact that, uh, you know, if we don't hold on, on to our lands, we, we will be, you know, roaming, roaming about wondering who we are. So I like that idea. And I do believe that part of reparatory justice as a, as a 10, 12 or 20 or 30 point plan that returning crown lands to uh, people, especially on the basis that they never got the lands that they were supposed to get uh but it would really strengthen those communities and we know when people live in communities that they're better people we see what happened to when the when we uh, destroyed africville and put people in public housing and the kinds of uh, uh outcomes that we got there they were they were not good i i, I think that's an excellent idea and i think that uh, it's in in addition to beachville in addition to i'm sorry hammond's plains i know this is being talked about uh quite widely in a number of communities right now and the land clarifications uh, project funded by the province under the leadership of, of uh, the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs, where they've appointed two legal um, stalwarts, um, Judge Corrine Sparks being one of them. Uh, and I'm forgetting the name of the second person, but basically presiding over some of the work around land clarification and titles and that sort of also meets up with this whole idea of uh, community land trusts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Delmona, are, are there any references describing what happened to the Black loyalists who returned to Sierra Leone? Yes. You know, uh, a number of years back, there was on the 200th anniversary, a number of people from the Black Cultural Center uh, did go there to uh make a a a, a voyage to honor uh the blacks who left to go to freetown sierra leone but there's been um many um uh, uh i should say initiatives that have connected uh people from sierra leone to those here in nova scotia uh there are people here who have been part of um and that's the group, as I mentioned earlier, connecting to Africa Association, which is taking cohorts of people to West Africa uh, to rediscover their identity, their African identity. That connecting to Africa, CTA, they were initially called Cotton Tree Initiative, CTA, Cotton Tree Initiative, because when the uh, Loyalists and Maroons arrived there, from Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotians, they planted a, a tree, a cotton tree as a commemorative space. And so um, there's an area where they have a huge cotton tree 
and um, this is sort of like a marker or a monument to to Nova Scotia. So when you go there, and then if you in, in people who have, and I haven't been to Sierra Leone, and I was about to go, I was signed up to go, and then there was a state of emergency for political issues that were happening there, and then um, the Ebola virus uh, broke out, so we did not go with the Cotton Tree Group to to get there, the Connecting to Africa Group. Uh, but some of the last, it's very interesting because you know the last names of, of African uh, peoples uh, who were not uh, abducted and brought here are uh, are different. So, but if you go to Sierra Leone, you're going to find the names that have been anglicized because of the fact that those the people who went back, you know, had first been enslaved people in the United States and then here and then moved on to the Freetown. So you some of the last names that you'll hear in, in Sierra Leone is just mind but like last name Wise or or Thomas, uh, names that you hear here in Nova Scotia. So and, and many others. And so um, th as I said, there have been uh, projects and of uh, people coming here and doing exchanges, etc. And so Interestingly, one of the things, and I did some research on this and wrote a paper on this uh, many, many years ago, you know, there's always that ulterior motive. Part of the uh, Sierra Leone company, when they were recruiting people to come to uh, uh, Freetown, it wasn't as altruistic as it seemed. It was, they were really looking for a, 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 um, a cohort or a group of people to settle in Sierra Leone that were more uh, already acculturized to British ways, to European ways that they could have as a labor source that could also help to uh, insert them in the in, in, insert them to be sort of like I guess the class of people that would take over from the British, and so it creates it created a lot of political uh, dissonance there that these new settlers um, who have been you know in uh, North America for that many years were then empowered by the British to become the uh, decision makers and the governing people. So there's still to this day, a lot of uh, uh, dissonance there in terms of those who came from Sierra Leone, those who went to Sierra Leone and those who were indigenous to Sierra Leone, that they were used to help them to um, settle the interior of Sierra Leone by giving them the roles and they remain loyal to the British and that caused a lot of difficulty. Okay, uh, Nilvana, I think we've got just time for one more question. Uh, there are two or three still in the queue, but I'll uh, put this one out and perhaps you can uh, respond to this one. Uh, the question is, uh, can you speak on the legal case for reparations for African Nova Scotians in particular? What are current cases in front of courts right now, and do you think, uh, and what do you think is needed for a case to be successful? Of course, that's a that's a mouthful, but one yeah. could probably make a career of that one. There are no legal cases in front of the courts right now in Nova Scotia. The community of Africville, the Africville community, there is a, a consortium of people who have been trying to get uh, standing to be able to bring forward a class action suit for reparatory justice for what happened to Africa. Uh, that is, is is still ongoing. They were, they were turned down and then now they are working for an appeal to be able to do that. I think that mounting a legal case and it's not just a legal case. The other thing too is that it's a legal case, but it's also a moral case. Somewhat, very much like what the leadership that we are the benefactors of in terms of the Caribbean community, where they are certainly, and they have retained much legal counsel. In fact, they retained the legal counsel of the same uh, organization that took the case of the Kenyan Mau Mau's to the British uh, and to win that case. But they are looking to negotiate with the colonial powers first, rather than tie up all these resources in a legal battle. And, you know, establishing uh, a legal case, I think, can certainly happen. And I think the way in which 
the, the, the information needs to be collected and, and, and profiled and presented can certainly and should be uh, presented in the same way that one would mount a legal case. And in fact, some of the very early people who have been, you know, the um, leaders in the rep reparations movement have been legal scholars. And, but, you know, we need the historic, the, the scholars of history as well to be able to, you know, get the information, the narratives to, to support that. So, interestingly, I think that mounting a case for reparatory justice in Nova Scotia is not as difficult as one might think. There's so many, as I've enumerated, glaring examples in terms of whether it's like schools, whether, you know, in segregated schools, whether it is housing, whether it is the land grants that, you know, with a, a bit of resources, if we were to establish, and this is one of the things I'm advocating for as well, we, if we were to establish a reparations commission here in Nova Scotia resourced to hire researchers, historians, legal scholars, and to do this work. And two names that I'm going to put out there whose names, names of people that people who know, uh, Judge Corrine Sparks, when she did her master's after being uh, in law, she uh, actually did her uh, her thesis and research on reparations, reparatory justice, in particular, the, the story of Africa. Michelle Williams was also a lawyer, and I would call her a legal scholar as well, who teaches at Dalhousie Law School, has also done significant research from a legal perspective on reparations. So we have people right here in our, our midst in tiny Nova Scotia who have already, a long time ago, been thinking about this because they've did, done this work uh, in the case of the uh, at least, at least almost two decades ago. Um, so I, I believe that now, especially where we have so many um, African, not a lot, but we still need more, a lot more African Nova Scotian lawyers than we had years ago, thankfully because the Indigenous Black Enigma and Law Program. And if we were to have a commission, a reparations commission, a center for reparations research in the same way that they've set up in uh, the Caribbean, I think we would not have to be long in the tooth before getting the uh, uh, history and the stories, the narratives, and the legal uh, justification to be able to mount and present a case for reparations for African Nova Scotians. Wow. That's it. I hope it's fine. Del that was amazing. That was a terrific lecture. I certainly, and I'm sure um, most of us, uh, have a much better understanding um, about the legacy of uh, slavery, of the harm done, and how it has trickled all the way through. And when you think that you know reparations were paid to slave owners because of the property they lost, it's, a, it's amazing. But what you've done is really, really deepened my understanding and I'm sure everybody else's on what can be done, how the damage is, is, is manifesting now and what can be done. And I can't thank you enough for the fabulous work you're doing. Thank you, thank you. It's truly my pleasure. I thank you guys for the great work you're doing for inviting me and having this opportunity and this forum to present this. And I hope that those who tuned in that they will uh, go about their way to uh, read up a bit more on this. Uh, if you're too busy to read, there's so much stuff on YouTube. You know, sometimes you can have to take in a little five five minute bites visually, put it on while you're around the house cooking or something or whatever. But to get that information, uh, because eventually this kind of transformative work really comes down to all of us as private citizens being able to you know support this kind of work when we speak with our elected officials around being able to resource this kind of work and uh, and the last thing i'll say is that when i think about the fact when we think about the fact that the black population in nova scotia is three percent three percent what would it really cost to be able to provide rehabilitation restitution satisfaction and guarantees of no repetition and compensation to 
3% of the population. That's not very much. I think is doable. If they can spend 40% of their budget in those times when things were tighter, I think that the government of Nova Scotia can start to well look at what would it take to be able to provide some satisfaction to 3% of one of the founding cultures of this province. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks also to our wonderful tech guys, Bill Lee and Bob Russell for their continuing work that they're doing. Um, please, everybody, check our website for our upcoming um, classes in the winter. And again, if anybody has any time at all, we can use whatever skills you have as volunteers with the organization. So from uh, the Seniors College, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. And again, Dalvina, a very, very heartfelt thanks for this. Thank you, Barb. Bye now.